should be recording. I'm gonna go find Grace. Grace? Grace? Oh, where is she? Grace? Grace? Grace! Grace! <laughs> what are you crying for? I can listen to the funny girl soundtrack again. It's, really, it's gotta be the fifth time this week. Just let it go, Grace. <laughs> Express, so I just made it. <laughs> nice espresso. I wonder who sent us an espresso machine. It was very nice. It was like it was just the right time. <laughs> we interrupt this message to bring you the maidens of Green Gables. This week, and um, we're just trying to establish what um, how many weeks we had left of reading, and I think it is three after this week. Yeah. So that means four more readings to go. It's getting very exciting. Yeah, and a lot has to happen too. So to wrap it up. Well, we're not quite at that point in the forest. Yes, we are. No. I mean, we're, we have thrown all caution to the wind. <laughs> we are over halfway, but I don't think it's caught enough to say there's too little time for all that has to happen yet. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> we are having a very busy week this week. We, uh, well, next week is Thanksgiving, as you all know. Hope you have lovely Thanksgiving plans in place. Um, so that's next week. Um, this Sunday is our cookie contest, and then, uh, we're having a friend over tomorrow afternoon, and, uh, what else? We went to our sister's, um, house. Yes, for a sleepover. Bones up cottage, uh, Monday and Tuesday, which is a lot of fun. Um, we so. got to show her Leap Year movie, which she'd never seen before, so it was quite funny. It made her laugh quite a lot, which was nice. Yes. Um... um we made our cookie packaging today. Um, we're doing this thing where we have a cup like for the top of it, like a plastic cup, and then you turn it upside down, and then you put a piece of paper underneath it, and the paper has four little flaps on either side that come up around it, and then you tie it with ribbon and a little silver suit. And so we made our bases today and eliminated the need of cardboard by putting four strands of uh, wrapping ribbon. Uh, of tying, of tying up. Uh, two strands of ribbon instead of just one and it made it a lot more sturdy so we, we we tied up our salt and pepper shaker inside the cup in place of our cookie <laughs> to uh, try it out so it's uh, still in there <laughs> um yeah but anyway we have lots of preparation work to do so it's very busy week but anyway so let's start reading um i'll start kevin i will start i kevin will start <coughs> <laughs> and um, Grace will <laughs> pick it up from there. <laughs> okay. Did you read more last week? Uh, I was trying to remember. I don't remember. Okay. Well. All right. Chapter um, Chapter eighteen. Also, funny side note: we are in the car with my sister, Jane. Yes, Jane, and um, her kids are listening to Katie Woodlawn on tape right now. And listening to that book, that lady talk, reading that book out loud, and then comparing it to our reading, it is, we are horrible. So <laughs> it was very funny, because she like, so it'd say a sentence, and then pause, and then say who said the sentence, and then pause again, 
And then it's like, oh my word, how do you do that? Because I'm having trouble trying to keep the inflection in there, you know, because from inflection. all the, Keep the inflection, you know, and make it not so blah. You know, my mom always, whenever we were, um, a thing the most remember about read alouds was mom once said, we were laughing at what something funny she had said. And she's like, well, you know, you don't want to be Monto. And she went, and then the cat walked in the door. And it was <laughs> really, really funny for us. We've always, I've always remembered that about public speaking or reading aloud that you need to look at your um, punctuation and um, make sure you add inflection. So, but listening to her, she was able to add inflection and you could actually get the way she was talking about <laughs> instead of having to take a double tick. <laughs> yeah, instead of reading a sentence and then say, saying something very sweetly and then saying she said angrily yeah. and then, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we will endeavor to use what we learned. No pressure. Right? Yeah. All right, let's call something else. That's actually the name of the chapter this week, so something is bound to, something is bound to happen. At one particular moment, the strange doubt first crept into Marguerite's mind she could not herself afterwards have said. With the ring tightly clutched in her hand, she had run out of the room, down to the stairs, down the stairs, and out into the garden, where in complete seclusion, alone with the flowers, and the river and the birds, she could look again at the ring and study the device more closely. Stupidly, sen stupidly senselessly, now, sitting beneath the shade of an overhanging sycamore, she was looking at the plain gold shield with the star-shaped little flower engraved upon it. Bah! It was ridiculous. She was dreaming. Her nerves were overwrought. She saw signs and mysteries and the most trivial coincidences. Had not everybody about town recently made a point of perfecting the device of that mysterious and heroic scarlet and fennel? Did she not herself wear it and it on her gown, set in gems and enamel in her hair? What was, what was there strange in the fact that Sir Percy should have it chosen to use the device as a seal ring? He might easily have said that. Yes, quite easily. And, besides, what connection could there be between her exquisitely dandy of a husband, her, between her exquisite dandy of a husband, with his fine clothes and refined lazy ways, and the daring plotter who rescued French victims from beneath the very eyes of the leaders of a bloodthirsty revolution? Her thoughts were in a whirl, her mind a blank. She did not see anything that was going on around her, and was quite startled when a fresh young voice called to her across the garden. Cherie, Cherie, where are you? said little Suzanne. Oh, I'm sorry. And little Suzanne, fresh as a rosebud, with eyes dancing with a glee, and brown curls fluttering in the soft morning breeze, came running across the lawn. They told me you were in the garden, she said. She went on prattling merrily, and throwing herself with pretty girlish impulse into Marguerite's arms. So I ran out to give you a surprise. You did not expect me quite so soon, did you, my little darling, my darling little Margot Cherie? Marguerite, who had hastily concealed the ring in the folds of her kerchief, tried to respond gaily and unconcerned, and unconcernedly to the young girl's impulses. Impulsiveness. Indeed, sweet one, she said with a smile, it is delightful to have you all to myself and for a nice whole day. You won't be, you won't be bored? Oh, bored! Margot, how can you say such a wicked thing? Why, when we were in the dear old convent together, we were always happy when we were all allowed to be alone together and to talk secrets. The two, girl, the two young girls had linked their arms in one another's and began wandering round the garden. "'Oh, how lovely your home is, Margot, darling,' said little Suzanne enthusiastically, "'and how happy you must be.' "'I, indeed, I ought to be happy, oughtn't I, sweet one?' said Marguerite with a wistful little sigh. "'How sadly you say it, Chevy. "'Ah, oh, well, I suppose that now you're a married woman you won't care to talk secrets with me any longer. "'Ah, oh, what lots and lots of secrets we used to have in school.' Do you, do you remember? Some we did not even confide to Sister Teresa of the Holy Angels, though she was such a dear. And now we ha you have one all-important secret, eh, little one? said Margaret merrily. Which you are not forthwith going to confide to me. Nay, you need not blush, Cherie, she added, as she saw Suzanne's pretty little crim face crimson with blushes. Faith, there's naught to be ashamed of. He's, he is a noble and true man, and one to be proud of as a lover. And as a husband. Indeed, Sherry, I am not ashamed, rejoined Suzanne softly, and it does make me very, very proud to hear you speak so well of him. I think Mamma will consent, she added thoughtfully, and I shall be, oh, so happy. But, of course, nothing is to be thought of until Papa is safe. Margaret started. Suzanne's father, the Comte de Tournay, 
one of those whose life would be jeopardized if Chauvelin succeeded in establishing the identity of his cousin Vernel. She had understood all along from the Comtesse and also from one or two of the members of the League that their mysterious leader had pledged his honour to, to bring the fugitive Comte de Tourne safely out of France, whilst little Suzanne, unconscious of all, save her own little all-important secret, went prattling on. Marguerite's thoughts went back to the events of the past night. Armand's peril, Chauvelin's fret, his cruel either-or, which she had accepted, and then her own work in the matter, which should have culminated in, at one o'clock in Lord Grenville's dining-room, when the relentless agent of the French government would finally learn who was this mysterious Scotland Fresnel, who so openly defied an army of spies and placed himself so boldly, and for mere sport, on the side of the enemies of France. Since then she had heard nothing from Chauvelin, she had concluded that he had failed, and yet she had not felt anxious about Armand, because her husband had promised her that her Armand would be safe. But now, suddenly, as Suzanne prattled merrily along, an awful horror came upon her for what she had done. Chauvelin had told her nothing, it was true, but she remembered how, sar how sarcastic and evil he looked when she took final leave of him at the after the ball. Had he discovered something then? Had he already laid his plans for catching the daring plotter, red-handed in France? and sending him to the guillotine without punk compunction or delay. Marguerite turned sick with horror, and her hand convulsively clutched the ring in her dress. "'You are not listening, Cherie,' said Suzanne, um, re reproachfully, as she paused in her long, high, interesting, highly interestingly, high, highly interesting narrative. "'Yes, yes, darling, indeed I am,' said Marguerite, with an effort, forced herself to smile. Forcing herself to smile. I love to hear you talking, and your happiness makes me so very glad. Have no fear, we will manage to propitiate, propitiate, propitiate Mamma. Sir Andrew Fuchs is a noble English gentleman. He has money and position. The Comtesse will not refuse his, her consent. But now, little one, tell me, what is the latest news about your father? Oh, said Suzanne with mad glee, the best we could possibly hear. My Lord Hastings came to see Mamma early this morning. He said that all is now well with dear papa, and we may safely expect him here in England in less than four days. Yes, said Marguerite, whose eye glowing eyes were fastened on Suzanne's lips, and she continued merrily. Oh, we have no fear now, you don't know, Cherie, that that great and noble Scotland Fennell himself has gone to say papa. He has gone, Cherie, actually gone, added Suzanne excitedly. He was in London this morning. He will be in Calais, perhaps tomorrow, where he will meet papa, and then, and then... The blow had fallen. She had expected it long ago. She had expected it all along, though she had tried for the past half hour to delude herself and to cheat her fears. He had gone to Calais, had been in London this morning. He, the Scots of Fresnel, Percy Blakeney, her husband, whom she had betrayed last night to Chauvelin. Percy, Percy, her husband, the Scots of Fresnel. Oh, how could she have been so blind? She understood it all now, all at once. That part he played, the mask he wore, in order to throw dust in everyone's eyes, and all for queer, and all for sheer sport and devilry, of course, saving women, men, children from death, as other men destroy and kill animals for the excitement, the love of the thing. The idle rich man wanted some aim in life. He and the few young bucks he o enrolled under his banner had amused themselves for months in risking their lives for the sake of an innocent few. Perhaps he had meant to tell her when they were first married, and then the first story, and then the story of the Marquis de saint Cyr had come to his ears, and he had suddenly turned from her thinking, no doubt, that she might some day betray him and his comrades, who had sworn to follow him, and so he had tricked her, as he tricked all others, whilst hundreds now owed their lives to him, and many families owed him both life and happiness. The mask of the inane fault had been a good one, and the part consum consum consumatively, 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 consumatively played, well played. No wonder that Chauvelin's spies had failed to detect in the apparently brainless nincompoop <laughs> the man whose reckless daring and resourceful ingenuity had baffled the keenest French spies, both in France and in England. Even last night, when Chauvelin went to Lord Grenville's dining room to seek that daring Scotland Fresnel, he only saw that inane Sir Percy Blakeney fast asleep in a corner of the sofa. Had his astute mind guessed the secret then? Here lay the whole horrible, awful, amazing puzzle. In betraying a nameless stranger to his fate, in order to save her brother, had Marguerite Blakeney sent her husband to his death. No, 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 a thousand times no, surely fate could not deal with a blow like that. 
nature itself would rise in revolt. Her hand, when it held that tiny scrap of paper last night, would surely have been struck numb ere it committed a deed so appalling and so terrible. But what is it, Cherie? said little Suzanne, now generally alarmed, for Marguerite's color had become dull and ashen. Are you ill, Marguerite? What is it? Nothing, nothing, child, she murmured as in a dream. Wait a moment. Let me think. Think. You said... The scarf of vanilla had gone to-day. Marguerite, Sherry, what is it? You frighten me. It is nothing, child, I tell you. Nothing. I must be alone a minute, and, and dear one, I may have to curtail our... I may have to curtail... Curtail our time together to get today. I may have to go away, you'll understand. I understand that something has happened, Sherry, and that you'll want to be alone. I won't be a hindrance to you. Don't think of me. Uh, my maid, Lucille, is not yet gone. We will go back together. Don't think of me. She threw her arms impulsively around Marguerite. Child as she was, she felt the poignancy of her friend's grief, and with the inane and with the infinite and with the infinite tact of her girlish tenderness, she did not try to pry into it. She was ready to efface herself. She kissed Marguerite again and again, then walked sadly back across the lawn. Marguerite did not move, she remained there thinking, wondering what was to be done. Just as Little Suzanne was about to mount the terrace steps. A groom came running round the house towards his mistress. He carried a sealed letter in his hand. Suzanne instinctively turned back. Her heart told her that there, that here perhaps was further ill news for her friend, and she felt that her poor Margot was not in a fit state to bear any more. The groom stood respectfully beside his mistress. Then he handed her the sealed letter. "'What is that?' asked Marguerite. "'Just come by runner, my lady.' Marguerite took the letter mechanically and turned it over in her trembling hands. "'Who sent it?' she said. "'The runner said, my lady,' replied the groom, "'that his orders were to, li were to, de to deliver this, "'and that your ladyship would understand from whom it came.' Marguerite tore open the envelope. Already her instinct had told her what it contained, and her eyes only glanced at it mechanically. It was a letter written by Armand St. Just to Sir Andrew Fuchs, the letter which Chauvelin's spies had stolen at the fisherman's rest— Wait a minute. 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 Didn't he say you've given that? Yes. When she... Oh! Yes. <laughs> the fisherman's... Okay. It was a letter written by Armand St. Just to Sir Andrew Fuchs. The letter which Chauvelin's spies had stolen at the fisherman's rest and which Chauvelin had held as a rod over her to enforce her obedience. Now he had kept his word. He had sent her back St. Just's promising letter. For he was on the track of the Scarlet and Brunel. Marguerite's sentence reeled. Her very soul seemed to be leaving her body. She tottered, and would have fallen but for Suzanne's arm around her waist. With superhuman effort, she regained control over herself. There was yet much to be done. "'Bring that runner here to me,' she said to the servant, with much calm. "'Has he has not gone?' "'No, my lady.' The groom went, and Marguerite returned, uh, turned to Suzanne. "'And you, child, run within. Tell Lucille to get ready. I fear that I must send you home, child, and stay—' Tell one of the maids to prepare a traveling dress and cloak for me. Why is she calling child when they're supposed to be the same age? I don't know. They must not be because, yeah, she must be must have been ahead of her in school because they keep on saying that she's a child. Um. Suzanne made no reply. She kissed Marguerite tenderly and obeyed without a word. The child was overawed by the terrible, nameless misery in her friend's face. In her friend's face. A minute later, the groom returned, followed by the runner who had brought the letter. Who gave you this packet? Asked Marguerite. A gentleman, my lady, replied the man at the Rose and Thistle in across opposite Charing Cross. He said you would understand. At the Rose and Thistle? What was he doing? He was waiting for the coach, your ladyship, which he had ordered. The coach? Yes, my lady, a special coach he had ordered. I understood from this from his man that he was posting straight to Dover. That's enough, you may go. Then she turned to the groom. My coach in the four swiftest horses in the stables to be ready at once. The groom and runner both went quickly off to obey. Marguerite remained standing for a moment on the lawn quite alone. Her graceful figure was as rigid as a statue. Her eyes were fixed. Her hands were tightly clasped across her breast. Her lips moved as they murmured with pathetic heartbreaking persistence. What's to be done? What's to be done? Where to find him? Oh, grant we light. But this was not the moment for remorse and despair. She had done unwittingly an awful and terrible thing, the very, very worst crime in her eyes that woman 
ever committed, she saw it in all its horror. His very blind, her very blindness in not having guessed her husband's secret seemed now to her another deadly sin. She ought to have known. She ought to have known. How could she? And how could she imagine that a man who could love her with so much with so much intensity as Percy Blakeney had loved her from the first? How could such a man be the brainless idiot she, he chose to appear? At, she at least ought to have known that he was wearing a mask, and, have fa and having found that out, she should have torn it from his face whenever they were alone together. Her love for him had been paltry and weak, easily crushed by her own pride, and she too had worn a mask in assuming a contempt for him, whilst, as a matter of fact, she had completely misunderstood him. But there was no time now to go over the past. Her own blindness had she had by her own blindness she had sinned. Now she must repay, not by empty remorse, but by prompt and useful action. Percy had started for Calais, utterly unconscious of the fact that his most relentless enemy was on his heels. He had set sail early that morning from London Bridge. Provided he had a favorable wind, he would no doubt be in France within twenty-four hours. No doubt he had reckoned on the wind and chosen this route. Chauvelin, on the other hand, would post to Dover charter a vessel there, and undoubtedly reach Calais much about the same time. Once in Calais, Percy would meet all those who were eagerly awaiting the noble, for the noble and brave Charles and Fennel, who had come to rescue them from horrible and unmerited death. With Chauvelin's eyes now fixed upon his every movement, Percy would thus not only be endangering his own life, but that of Suzanne's father, the old Comte de Tournay, and of all those other fugitives who were waiting for him and trusting in him. There were those, there were also Almond, there was also Almond who had gone to meet de Tournay, secure in the knowledge that the Scarlet Pimpernel was watching over his safety. All these lives and that of her husband lay in Marguerite's hands. These she must save, if human pluck and ingenuity were equal to the task. Unfortunately, she could not do all this quite alone. Once in Calais, she would not know where to find her husband, while Chauvelin, in stealing the papers at Dover, had obtained the whole itinerary. Above everything, she wished to warn Percy. She knew enough about him to, by now to understand that he would never abandon those who trusted in him, that he would ne not turn back from danger and to leave and leave the Comte de to fall into the bloodthirsty hands that knew no, of no mercy. But if he were warned, he might form new plans, be more wary, more prudent. Unconsciously, he might fall into a cunning trap, but at once warned, he might yet succeed. Succeed. And if he fails, if indeed fate and Chauvelin, with all the resources at his command, proved too strong for the daring plotter after all, then at least she would be there by his side to comfort, love, and cherish, to cheat death perhaps at the last by making it seem sweet, if they but died both together, locked in each other's arms, with the supreme happiness of knowing that passion had responded to passion, and that all misunderstandings were an end were at an end. Her whole body stiffened as with a great and firm resolution. This she meant to do if God gave her wits and strength. She, her eyes lost their fixed look, they glowed with inward fire at the thought of meeting him again so soon, in the very midst of de deadly perils. They sparkled with the joy of sharing these dangers with him, of helping him, perhaps, of being with him at the last, if she failed. But childlike sweet face had become hard and set, the curved mouth was closed tightly over her clenched teeth. She meant to do or die with him and for his sake. A frown which spoke of an iron will and unbending resolution appeared between the two straight brows. Already her plans were formed. She would go and find Sir Andrew Foops first. He was Percy's fr best friend, and Marguerite remembered with a thrill with what blind enthusiasm the young man always spoke of his mysterious leader. He would help her where she needed help. Her coach was ready. A change of raiment and farewell to little Suzanne, and she would be on her way. Without haste, but without hes without haste, but without hesitation, she walked quietly into the house. Oh my. Ah! Chapter twenty. The friend. Less than half an hour later, Marguerite, buried in thought, sat inside her coach, which was bearing her swiftly to London. She had taken an affectionate farewell of little Suzanne, and had seen the child safely sweated with her maid, in her own coach, turned uh, went in, in her own coach back to town. 
She had sent one courier with a respectful letter of excuse to his royal highness, begging for a postponement of the August visit on account of pressing and urgent business, and another on ahead to bespeak a fresh relay of horses at Faversham. Then she had changed her muslin frock for a dark traveling costume and mantle, had not provided herself with money, which her husband's lavishness always placed fully at her disposal, and had started out on her way. She did not attempt to delude herself with any vain and futile hopes. The safety of her brother Armand would was to have been conditional to the in, on the imminent capture of the Scarlet Brunel. Dear, dear. As, she, <clears throat> as Chauvelin had sent her back Armand's compromising letter, there was no doubt that he was quite satisfied in his own mind that Percy Blakeney was the man whose death he had sworn to bring about. No, there was, ro there was no room for any fond delusions. Percy, the husband whom she loved, with all the adore at the ad ador, that, or, or, ador, 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 Ardor. Ardor. <laughs> ardor. Ardor. It's like, it's ardor. <laughs> Percy, the husband whom she loved with all the ardor. Really? Ardor, which her, his, which her administration for his bravery had kindled, was in immediate deadly peril through her hand. She had betrayed him to his enemy, unwittingly it is true, but she had betrayed him, and if Chauvelin succeeded in trapping him, which, who so far was unaware of his danger, then his death would be at her door. His death. When with her very heart's blood she would have defended him, and given willingly her life for his. She ordered her. She had ordered her coach to drive to the Crown Inn once there. She told her coachman to give the horses food and rest. Then she ordered a chair and had herself carried to the house in Pall Mall, where Sir Andrew Fuchs lived. Among all, Percy, among all Percy's friends who were enrolled under his daring banner, she thought that she would prefer to confide in Sir Andrew Fuchs. He had always been her friend, and now his love of little Suzanne had brought him closer to her still. Had he been away from home, gone on a mad errand with Percy, perhaps then she would have called on Lord Hastings or Lord Tony, for she wanted the help of one of these young men, or she would be indeed powerless to save her husband. Sir Andrew Fuchs, however, was at home, and his servant introduced her ladyship immediately. She went upstairs to the young man's comfortable bachelor chambers, and was shown into a small though luxuriously, luxuriously furnished dining room. A moment or two later, Sir Andrew himself appeared. He had evidently been much startled when he heard who his lady visitor was, for he looked anxiously, even suspiciously, at Marguerite, whilst performing the elaborate bows before her which the rigid etiquette of the time demanded. Elaborate bows. Marguerite had laid aside every vestige of nervousness. She was perfectly calm, and having returned the young man's elaborate salute, she began very calmly. Sir Andrew, I have no desire to waste valuable time and much talk. You must take certain things I am going to tell you for granted. They will be of, these will be of no importance. What is important is that your leader and comrade, the Scarlet Brunel, my husband, Percy Blakeney, is in deadly peril. Had she had the remotest doubt of the correctness of her deductions, she would have had them confirmed now, for, An for Sir Andrew, completely taken by surprise, had grown very pale and was quite incapable of making the slightest attempt at clever parrying. parrying. No matter how I know, but Sir Andrew, she said quietly, continued quietly, thank God that I do, and that perhaps it is not too late to save him. Unfortunately, I cannot do this quite alone, and therefore I've come to you for help. Lady Blakeney, said the young, young man, trying to recover himself. I, will you hear me first? She interrupted. This is how the matter stands. When the agent of the French government saw your papers that night in Dover, he found amongst them certain plans which you and your leader were to carry out for the rescue of the Count Tony and others. The Scott of Pimpernel, Percy, my husband, has gone on this errand himself today. Chauvelin knows that the Scott of Pimpernel and Percy Blakeney are one and the same person. You will follow him to Calais, and there lay hands on him. You will know, as well as I, you know as well as I, the fate that awaits him on the, at the hands of the revolutionary government of France. No interference from England, from King George himself, would save him. Robespierre and his gang will see to it that the interference came too late. But not only that, the most trusted leader will also have been unconsciously, have been well. But not only that, the much leader, much trusted leader will also have been unconsciously the means of revealing the hiding place to the Count Tony and of all those who even now are placing their hopes in him. She has spoken quietly, dispassionately, and with a firm, unbending resolution. Her purpose was to make that young man trust and help her, for she could do nothing without him. I do not understand, he repeated, trying to gain time to think what would be best to be done. Aye, but I think you do, Sir Andrew. You must know that I am speaking the truth. Look, these facts straight in the face. Percy is here I presume for some lonely part of the coast, and Chauvelin is on his track. He is posted for Dover, and will cross the channel probably tonight. What do you think will happen? 
The young man was silent. Percy will arrive at the destination. Unconscious of being followed, he will seek up to Tony and the others. Among these, Amand St. Just, my brother. He will seek them out, one after another, probably, not knowing that with the sharpest eyes in the world are watching his every movement. When he has thus unconsciously betrayed those who blindly trust in him, when nothing can be gained from him, and then he is ready to come back to England with those whom he has gone so bravely to save, the doors of the trap will close upon him, and he will be sent to end his noble life upon the guillotine. Still, Sir Andrew was silent. You do not trust me, she said passionately. Oh, my, can't you see that I am in deadly earnest? Man, man, she added, whilst in her tiny hand she seized the young man suddenly by the shoulders, forcing him to look straight at her. Tell me, do I look like that vilest thing on earth, a woman who will betray her own husband? God forbid, Lady of Lakeney, said the young man at last, that I should attribute such evil motives to you, but... But what? Tell me, quick man, the very, scarce... Bleh. the very seconds are precious. Will you tell me, he asked resolutely, and, with, and looking searchingly into her blue eyes, whose hand helped to guide and Chauvelin to the knowledge which you say he possesses? Mine, he said quietly. I own it, and I will not lie to you, for I wish you to trust me absolutely. But I have no, I had no idea. How could I have... Of the identity of Sergeant Brunel, and our brother's safety was to be my prize if I succeeded. In helping Chauvelin to track Sergeant Brunel, she nodded. It is no use telling you how he forced my hand. Armand is more than a brother to me, and, and how could I guess? Well, we waste time, Sir Andrew. Every precious second, every second is precious. In the name of God, my husband is in peril. Your friend, your comrade, help me to save him. Sir Andrew felt his position to be a very awkward one. The oath he had taken before his leader and comrade was one of obedience and secrecy, and yet the beautiful woman who was asking him to trust her was undoubtedly in earnest. His friend and leader was, un was equally undoubtedly in imminent danger, and... Lady Blakeney said at last, God knows how you perplexed me, so that I do not know which way... My duty lies. Tell me what you wish me to do. There are nineteen of us ready at dawn to lay down our... Oh, sorry. There are nineteen of us ready to lay down our lives for Scarlet Brunel if he is in danger. There is no need for lives just now, my friend, he said dryly. My wits and force of horses will serve the purpose, the necessary purpose. But I must know where to find him. See, she added with her, whilst her eyes filled with tears, I have humbled myself before you. I have, conf I have owned my fault to you. Shall I also confess my weakness? My husband and I have been estranged because he did not trust me and because I was too blind to understand. You must confess that the bandage which you put over my eyes was a very thick one. Is it small wonder that I did not see through it? But last night, as it led them unwittingly into such deadly peril, it suddenly fell from my eyes. If you would not help me, Sir Andrew, I would still strive to save my husband. I will, will still exert every faculty I possess for his sake. But I might be powerless, for I might arrive too late, and nothing could be done for you. Nothing will be left for you but lifelong remorse, and, and for me, a broken heart. But Lady Blakeney, said the young man, touched by the gentle earnestness of this exquisitely beautiful woman, do you know that what you propose doing is man's work? You cannot possibly journey to Calais alone. You will be running the greatest risk possible to yourself, and your chances of finding your husband now, were I to direct you ever so carefully, are infinitely remote. Oh, I hope there are risks, she murmured softly. I hope there are dangers, too. I have so much to atone for. But I fear you are mistaken. Chauvelin's eyes are fixed upon you all. He will scarcely notice me. Fix, Sir Andrew, the coach is ready, and there is not a moment to be lost. I must get to him. I must, she repeated with almost savage en energy, to warn him that the man is on his track. Can't you see? Can't you see that I must get to him? Even, even if it be too late to save him, at least to be by his side at the last. Faith, madam, you must command me. Madly would I or any of my comrades lay down our lives for your husband. If you will go yourself, nay, friend, do you not, do you not see that I would go mad if I let you go without me? She stretched out her hand to him. You will trust me? I await your orders, he said simply. Listen then. My coat is ready to take me to Dover. Do you follow me as swift do follow do you follow me as swiftly as horses will take you? Do you follow me? Hmm. We'll meet at nightfall at the fisherman's rest. Chauvelin would avoid it, as he is known there, and I think it will be the safest. I will gladly accept your escort to Calais. As you say, I might miss a Percy where you direct me ever so carefully. We'll charter a schooner at Dover and cross over during the night, disguised, if you will agree to it, as my lackey, you, you will, I think, escape detection. detection. I am entirely at your service, madame, rejoined the young man earnestly. I trust to God that you will, be set, that you will sight with Adrian before we reach Cali. With Chauvelin at his heels, every step the God people now takes on French soil is fraught with danger. God grant it, Sir Andrew, but now farewell. We will meet tonight at Dover. It will be a race between Chauvelin and me across the channel tonight, and the prize, 
My life was cut in vanilla. He kissed her hand and then escorted her to her chair. A quarter of an hour later, she was back on the at the Crown Inn, where her coach and horses were ready and waiting for her. The next moment, they thundered along the London streets, and then straight on to the Dover Road at maddening speed. She had no time for despair now. She was up and doing what she was up and doing, and had no leisure to think. With Sir Andrew Fuchs as her companion and ally, hope had once again revived in her heart. God would be merciful. He would not allow so appalling a crime to be committed as the death of a brave man through the hand of a woman who loved him and worshipped him and who would gladly have died for his sake. Margaret's thoughts flew back to him, the mysterious hero whom she had always unconsciously loved, when his identity was still unknown to her. Laughingly, in the olden days, she used to call him the shadowy king of her heart, and now she had suddenly found that this enatic personality whom she had worshipped and the man who loved her so passionately were one and the same. What wonder that one or two happy visions she began to force their way before her mind. She vaguely wondered what she would say to him when first they would stand face to face. She had had no so many anxieties, so much excitement over the past few hours that she allowed herself the luxury of nursing these few more hopeful, brighter thoughts. Gradually, the rumble of the coach wheels with its incessant monotony acted soothingly on her nerves. Her eyes, aching with fatigue and many shed and unshed tears, closed involuntarily, and she fell into a troubled sleep. Chapter 21. Suspense. It was late into the night when she had at last reached the fisherman's rest. But oh, Sally! <laughs> <laughs> she had done the whole journey in less than eight hours, thanks to innumerable changes of horses at the various coaching stations, for which she had always paid lavishly. For which she always paid lavishly, thus obtaining the very best and swiftest that could be had. Her coachman, too, had been infatigable. Did I say coachman? Yes. The promise of special and rich reward had no doubt helped to keep him up, and he had literally burned the ground beneath his mistress's coach wheels. The arrival of Lady Blakeney in the middle of the night caused a considerable flutter at the fisherman's wrist. Sally jumped hastily out of bed, and Mr. Jellyband was at great pains how to make his important guest comfortable. Both these good folk were far too well drilled in the manners obtaining to innkeepers to exhibit the slightest surprise at Lady Blakeney's arrival, alone at this extraordinary hour. No doubt they thought all the more, but Margaret was so was far absorbed was far too absorbed in the important, the deadly earnestness of her journey to stoop and ponder over trifles of that sort. The coffee room, the scene lately of the dastardly outrage on two English gentlemen, was quite de deserted. Mr. Jellyband hastily relit the lamp, rekindled a cheerful bit of fire in the great hearth, and then wheeled a comfortable chair by it, into which Margaret gratefully sank. "'Will your ladyship stay the night?' asked pretty Miss Sally, who was already busy laying a snow-white cloth on the table, preparatory to providing a simple supper for her ladyship. "'No, not the whole night,' replied Marguerite. "'At any rate, I should not want any room but this, if I can have it to myself for an hour or two. "'It is at your ladyship's service,' said honest Jellyband, whose rubicund face was set in its tightest folds, lest it should betray before the quality that boundless astonishment which the worthy fellow had begun to feel.' I shall be crossing over at the first turn of the tide, said Marguerite, in the, and in the first schooner I can find, I can get. But my coachman and men will stay the night, and probably several days longer, so I hope you will make them comfortable. Yes, my lady, I'll look after them. Shall Sally bring your lordship, your ladyship, some supper? Yes, please, but put something cold on the table, and as soon as Sir Andrew Fuchs comes, show him in here. Yes, my lady. Honest Mr. Jellyband's face now expressed distress in spite of himself. He had great regard for Sir Percy Blakeney, and did not like to see his lady running away without Sir An with young Sir Andrew. <laughs> oh no! Of course, it was still no business of it was no business of his, and Mr. Jellyband was no gossip. Still, in his heart, he recollected that her ladyship was, after all, only one of them foreigners. What wonder that she was immoral like the rest of them? Don't sit up, honest Jellyband," continued Margaret kindly. "Nor you either, Mr. Sally. Sir Andrew may be late. Jellyband was only too." willing that Sally should go to bed. <laughs> he was beginning not to like these goings-on at all. Still, Lady Blakeney would pay handsomely for the accommodation, and it certainly was no business of his. Sally arranged a simple supper of cold meat, wine, and fruit on the table, 
Then, with a respective curtsy, she retired, wondering in her little mind why her ladyship looked so serious when she was about to elope with her gallant. <laughs> then commenced a period of weary waiting for Marguerite. She knew that Sir Andrew, who would have to provide himself a clothes befitting a lackey, could not possibly reach Dover for at least a couple of hours. He was a splendid horseman, of course, and would make light in such an emergency of the seventy-odd miles between London and Dover. He would, too, li literally burn the ground beneath his horse's hooves, that he might not always get very good remounts, and in any case he would not have started from London until at least an hour after she did. She had not seen anything of Chauvelin on the road. Her coachman, whom she questioned, had not seen any one answering the description of his mistress, answering the description his mistress gave him of the wizened figure of the little Frenchman. Evidently, therefore, he had ahead, been ahead of her all the time. He, she had not dared to question the people at the various inns where they had stopped to change horses. She feared that the Chauvelin had spies all along the route, who might overhear her questions, then now distance her and warn the enemy of her approach. Now she wondered at what inn he might be stopping, or whether he had had the good luck of chartering a vessel already, and was now himself on the way to France. That thought gripped her at the heart as with an iron v vise. She indeed, she, if indeed she should be too late already. The loneliness of the room overwhelmed her. Everything within was so horribly still. The ticking of the grandfather clock, dreadfully slow and measured, was the only sound which broke this, this law awful loneliness. Marguerite had need of all her energy, all her steadfastness of purpose, to keep up her courage through this weary midnight waiting. Everyone else in the house but herself must have been asleep. She had heard Sally go upstairs. Mr. Jellyband had gone to see her coachman and men, and then she had, and then had returned and taken up a position under the porch outside, just where Marguerite had just met Chauvelin about a week ago. He had ev evidently meant to wait up for Sir Andrew Fuchs, but was soon overcome by sleepy slumbers, for presently, in addition to the slow ticking of the clock, Marguerite could hear the monotonous and dulcet tones of the worthy fellow's breathing. For some time now she had realized that the beautiful, warm October's day, so happily begun, had turned into a rough and cold night. She had felt very chilly and was glad of the cheerful blaze in the hearth, but gradually, gradually, as time wore on, wore on, the weather became more rough, and the sound of the great breakers against the Admiral, Admiralty Pier, Admiralty Pier, though some distance from the inn, came to her as the noise of muffled thunder. The wind was becoming boisterous, rattling the leaded windows and massive doors of the old-fashioned house. It shook the trees outside and roared down the vast chimney. Marguerite wondered if the wind would be favorable for her journey. She had no fear of the storm and would have braved worse risks sooner than delay the crossing by the hour. A sudden commotion outside roused her from her meditations. Evidently, it was Sir Andrew Fuchs just arriving in mad haste, for she heard his her horse's hooves thundering on the flagstones outside. Then Mr. Jellyband, sleeping at cheerful tones, bidding him welcome. For a moment then, the awkwardness of her position struck Marguerite alone at this hour, in a place where she was well known, and having made an, assi an, an assignation with a young cavalier equally well known, and who arrived in disguise. What fool for gossip to those mischievously inclined! The idea struck Marguerite chiefly from its humorous side. There was such a quaint contrast between the seriousness of her errand and the construction which would naturally be put on her actions by honest Mr. Jellyband that, for the first time since many hours, a little smile began playing around the corners of her childlike mouth, and when presently Sir Andrew, almost unrecognizable in his lackey-like garb, entered the coffin, she was able to greet him with a, quite a merry laugh. "'Faith, Monsieur, my lackey,' she said, "'I am satisfied with your appearance.' <laughs> Mr. Jellyband had followed Sir Andrew, looking strangely perplexed. The young gallant's disguise had confirmed his worst suspicions. <laughs> Without a smile upon his jovial face, he drew the cork from the bottle of wine, set the chairs ready, and prepared to wait. "'Thanks, honest friend,' said Marguerite, who was still smiling at the thought of what the worthy fellow must be thinking at that very moment. "'We shall require nothing more, and here's for all the trouble you have been put to on our account.' She had handed two or three gold pieces to Jellyband, who took them respectfully and with becoming gratitude. Stay, Lady Blakeney, interposed Sir Andrew, as Jellyband was about to retire. I am afraid we shall require something more of my jelly my friend Jellyband's hospitality. I am sorry to say we cannot cross over tonight. Not cross over tonight, she repeated in amazement. But we must, Sir Andrew, we must. There can be no question of cannot, and whatever it may cost, we must get a vessel tonight. 
but the young man shook his head sadly. I am afraid it is not a question of cost, Lady Blakeney. There is a nasty storm blowing from France. The wind is dead against us. We cannot possibly sail until it is changed. Marguerite became de deadly pale. She had not seen this. Nature herself was playing her horrible, cruel trick. Percy was in danger, and she could not go to him, because the wind happened to blow from the coast of France. But we must go, we must, he repeated, with strange persistent energy. You know we must go. Can't you find a way? I have been down to shore already, he said, and had a talk to one or two skippers. It is quite impossible to set sail tonight, so every sailor assured me. No one, he added, looking significantly at Marguerite, no one can possibly, could possibly put out of Dover tonight. Uh, Marguerite at once understood what he meant. No one, including Chauvelin as well as herself. She nodded pleasantly to Jellyband. Well, then, I must resign myself, she said to him. Have you a room for me? Oh, yes, your ladyship, a bright, nice, airy room. I'll see to it at once. And there is another one for Sir Andrew, both quite ready. That's brave now, my honest Jelly, said Sir Andrew gaily, clapping his worthy host vigorously on the back. You will unlock both those rooms and leave your, our candles here on the dresser. I vow you are dead without sleep, and her ladyship must have some supper before she retires. There, have no fear, friend of the rule for countenance. Her ladyship's visit, though at this unusual hour, is a great honour to thy house, and Sir Blakeney will reward thee doubly, if thou seest well to her privacy and comfort. Sir Andrew had no doubt guessed the many conflicting doubts and fears which raged in honest Jellyband's head, and as he was a gallant gentleman, he tried, he tried by this brave hint to allay some of the worthy innkeeper's suspicions. He had the satisfaction of seeing that he had partially succeeded. Jellyband's rubicund, rubicund, rubicund countenance brightly brightened somewhat at a mention of Sir Percy's name. I'll go and see to it at once, sir, he said with alacrity and with less frigidity in his manner. Has her ladyship any, everything she wants for supper? Everything thanks to honest friend, and I am famished and dead with fatigue. I pray you see to the rooms. <laughs> Now tell me, she said eagerly, as soon as Jellyband had gone from the room, tell me all your news. There is nothing else much to tell you, Lady Blakeney, replied the young man. The storm makes it quite impossible for any vessel to set out of Dover this tide. But what seemed to you at first a terrible calamity is really a blessing in disguise. If we cannot cross over to France tonight, Chauvelin is in the same quandary. He may have left before the uh, storm broke out. God grant he may, said Sir Andrew merrily, for very likely then he'll have been driven out of his course. Who knows? <laughs> we may, he may now even be lying at the bottom of the sea, for there's a furious storm raging, and it will fare ill with all small craft that happen to be out. But I fear we cannot build our hopes upon the shipwreck of that cunning devil, and of all his murderous plans. The sailors I spoke to all assured me that no schooner had put out of Dover for several hours, and on the other hand, I ascertained that I stranger had arrived by coach this afternoon and had, like myself, made some inquiries about crossing over to France. Then Chauvelin is still in, in Dover. Undoubtedly. Shall I go away, lay him, and run my sword through him? That, would, that were indeed the quickest way of, out of the difficulty. Nay, Sir Andrew, do not jest. At last, I have often since last night caught myself wishing for that friend's death, fiend's death. But what you suggest is impossible. The laws of this country do not permit of murder. It is only in our beautiful France that wholesale slaughter is done loyal, lawfully in the name of liberty and of brotherly love. Sir Andrew had persuaded her to sit down to the table to partake of some supper and to drink a little wine. This enforced rest of at least twelve hours until the next tide was sure to be terribly difficult to bear in the state of intense excitement in which she was. Obedience in these small matters like a child, Marguerite tried to eat and drink. Sir Andrew, with that profound sympathy born in all those who are in love, made her almost happy by talking to her about her husband. He recounted to her some of the daring escapes the brave Scot and Fennel had contrived for the poor French fugitives, whom a relentless and bloody revolution was driving out of their country. He made her eyes glow with enthusiasm by telling her of his bravery, his ingenuity, his resourcefulness, which, when it meant snatching the lives of men and women and even children from beneath the very edge of that murderous, ever-ready guillotine. He even made her smile quite merrily by telling her of the Scots and Fennel's quaint and many disguises, through which he had baffled the strictest watch set against him at the barricade of France, of Paris. This last time the escape of the Countess de Tourney and her children had been a veritable, excuse me, a veritable masterpiece. 
Blakeney disguised as a hideous old woman, old market woman, in filthy cap and stra straggling grey locks, was a sight fit to make the gods laugh. Marguerite laughed heartily as Sir Andrew tried to describe Blakeney's appearance, those bravest difficulty always consisted in his great height, which in France made disguise doubly difficult. Marguerite laughed heartily as Sir Andrew tried to describe Blakeney's appearance, whose gravest difficulty always consisted in his great height, which in France made disguise doubly difficult. Thus an hour wore on. There were many more to spend in enforced inactivity in Dover. Marguerite rose from the table with an impatient sigh. She looked forward with dread to the night in the bed upstairs, with terribly anxious thoughts to keep her company, and the howling of the storm to help chase deep sleep away. To help chase sleep away. She wondered where Percy was now. The daydream was a strong, well-built, sea-going yacht. Sir Andrew had expressed the opinion that no doubt she had gotten the lee of the wind before the storm broke out. Or else perhaps she had... Or perhaps had not... Or else, perhaps, not had not ventured into the open at all, but was lying quietly at Gravesend. Briggs was an expert skipper, and Sir Percy handled the schooner as well as any master mariner. There was no danger for them from the storm. It was long past midnight when, at last, Marguerite retired to rest. As she had feared, sleep sedu sedulously avoided her eyes. Her thoughts were of the blackest during these long, weary hours, whilst the that incessant storm raged which was keeping her away from Percy. The sound of the distant breakers made her heart ache with, with melancholy. melancholy. She was in the mood when the sea had a saddening effect upon her nerves. It, was only, it is only when we are very happy that we can bear to gaze merrily upon the vast and limitless expanse of water, rolling on and on with such persistent, irritating monotony, to the accompaniment of our thoughts, whether grave or gay. When they are gay, the echoes echo their gaiety. But when they are sad, then every breaker as it rolls seems to bring additional sadness, and to speak of, to us of hopelessness and of the pettiness of all our joys. That's what we love. Oh, it's so good! And, uh, it's so sad! Okay, stop saying that. <laughs> no, 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 I don't mean... This, I don't mean, I don't mean what I was saying before about it being sad. I mean that it's sad that the movie skipped all this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> our friends who are the, who are fans of the Leslie Howard version are going to be very happy with me. <laughs> they like that one better than the other one. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Okay, we totally need to watch their version. Again. The Leslie Howard one. And then I will try to dig up a high school version of the play. And then... I watch all three back to back. Not back to Not all three. Just those Aww. two. <laughs> 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 Let's see. That's the other one. It looks like that. <laughs> We have the other one practically memorized. I don't think we just watched it recently. No, we have to watch it again after we, we did it. We just watched it like a couple months ago. We'll invite her where everyone is listening to this, and we'll all watch it together. Why okay, not? We're going to be in Missouri the next couple weeks. <laughs> um, yeah, but at least those two. And then I say that Carissa will come and watch it with us. Watch it, <laughs> Carissa. <laughs> I think we need. Um, I totally think we need to do a, a casting of this because That's so they need dope. a ca when was the last movie made? Like what, the seventies, eighties? Somewhere Oh oh you mean at least twenty yeah. twenty years ago. No, so don't, it is time. Don't. No, you yeah. cannot say yeah. that. No, you can't yes, say I, that. I can't too say no, that. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Because <laughs> you Yes can't. I can No, you can't say that. It's like Thing that <laughs> no, I was simply okay. You know no, all the not. remakes of Pride and Prejudice. There are there are Little Women. Yes, there are. And Little Women. There are okay. Cinderella. There are. Okay, Cinderella is different. But... Anyways, but I'm saying there is, are tons of remakes, especially right now, of things going on. You know, so they should totally redo it. No. Yeah. I... Yes. Yes. <laughs> Let me finish. Um. The only thing that they need to do, 
make a TV show out of it because and like use all the yes stop you know, doing it look in a mini series yeah like a mini series yeah, because it'll be too short for a movie and it will be lovely and we can put on a lovely people too, in it too long for a movie yeah so I do admit that the mini series part of that would be a good effect to have on it to leave off and everything and that kind of thing but but. You can't say that. Say what? You can't say, oh, it's been so long, so they should re remake it. That's what happened no, when they... No, there's only two! They said that about Sound Music and see what that got us. Yeah. Yes. Right, but... Okay. Do you want them to make a new version of Swiss Home Robinson? Hmm? They already did, and they ruined it. Exactly. Like, my point exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. No, if something is... If something is... If something... I'm sure there is, but I'm just saying. Think of something. I can't think of it. Redeem it. Um, okay, I'll tell you what. I got a better idea. Instead of your miniseries, let's have them. They should film the musical. That's what they should do. That would be wonderful. Yes, but we haven't seen musical to know that we like it. But we should like it. So I mean, let's go ahead with it. We're predisposed not to like it. Because of what we heard from the soundtrack. The soundtrack wasn't that great. But anyway. No. Or they're predisposed not to like what? The musical? Yeah, because the soundtrack wasn't that great. No, it was so good. The soundtrack? You're the one who said this. Not that was the people that were chosen yeah. for the soundtrack. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about... Uh, it, uh, the soundtrack is what makes the musical a musical. No, no, the soundtrack is really good. Where's the girl? Yeah. And, and um, where's the girl? And, and, and into the, the storybook and Into the Fire? Yes, it is. It has some good ones, but not all of them are... Good. Like, his song is just kind of weird. Well, you just need the right person to play the, play the part for one, number one. Yeah. And they can also write new, more songs. Mm. Anyway. But anyway, they should, um... With Tony... We well, should fill the version with Tony Yasevic and... Laura Osnes. Yeah. And Corey Cott. Anyway. Um... Um... I saw some of the cast at the end. I don't see why we should Dreamcast that. Because Adele. fun! I find it fun. Thank you. Fun. Yeah. Who's playing her? Come. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. He needs to be somebody tall. Who do we know that's tall? I wonder if, if what you call it could actually pull it off. Who's what you call it? We'll never know. <laughs> uh, you know, what's the thing? Oh, I don't think he could pull it off. <laughs> He'd be awful. <laughs> uh, Mr. Thornton. You're having him because it has been played with one. <laughs> no! But he could. What's his name? Richard Armitage. He could be really. Um, he could, he could be, be very. A he could be. I, I don't know if he could or not. No way. Ouch. <laughs> he could play. He could play. Okay, I know who he should play. Alright. Richard Armitage should play Chauvelin. You already said that. I did. Yeah. Well, I'm saying it again. <laughs> <laughs> I already said that? Yeah! Cursor just commented about it, and you know? No! Yes! I didn't say that! Yes, you did. Did I? Yes! Try to remember last over there? <laughs> yeah, what is this place? <laughs> yeah, no, Short no, who's, who is tall? Who is tall? Like an actor who's tall. What's that got to do with it? He's tall! He needs to be tall! Matthew McFadden, but no. No. <laughs> Um, Hugh Jackman? Ew, no. No, no, no. Why not? No. Yeah, it's too we old. Don't, we don't need to be thinking about this now. If we're going to do it, we'll say it for later. Disastrous post. <laughs> anyway, alright, so let's uh, talk about these. What happened in the chapters? Suzanne, I'm sorry. I'm just getting a little annoyed with Suzanne. I don't, yeah, I don't like Suzanne. I'm sure she's. I, I'm sure we just need somebody to. I'm sure I just need a visual, a good visual of you her, have a visual. and I mean, of what she's like in the book. A good visual, and I would like her, and it would be fine. But just how I'm getting, getting her coming across in the book, it just is like, yeah, child. I don't know. Well, yeah, but but I'm just a little annoying. I don't know. Anyway, so okay, the best line out of this whole group of chapters was. Let's see. Right. Let me see. Yeah, let me see. <laughs> um, where is it? Who says okay, bah this is it. in your life? This though? is it. Wait, wait, wait. I'm saying something. Who says bah in your life? 
Like, is that supposed to be, like, does anybody actually say that? I don't. Do you? <laughs> not, not, <laughs> even today, in, in nowadays, but. No, I mean, it's always in the old books, but I mean, if we stop saying it now. Bah. Bah. Like, it's like, <laughs> for sure, I guess, more like. No one says that either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do, it's like, they do, but it's like, not, like, the stuff that's like, you can't spell out, like, the, all the letters, the smashing up the keys or whatever. Okay, the best line of the chapters that we read this week was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if he failed, if indeed fate and Chauvelin, with all the resources at his command, proved too strong for the daring plotter after all, then at least she would be there by his side to comfort, love, and cherish. Cherish. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> And if he failed, if indeed fate and Chauvelin, with all the resources, resources at his command, proved too strong for the daring plotter after all, then at least she would be there by his side to comfort, love, and cherish, to cheat death perhaps at the last by making it seem sweet, if they died both together, locked in each other's arms, with the supreme happiness of knowing that passion had responded to passion, and that all misunderstandings were at an end. <laughs> Wait, that was the best line? Yes! No, well, the best sign is like she said she'll die for him or die with him. I just read that. She didn't say she would die with him. Yes, she did. Can I see what It says if they die both together. Oh. Okay, but there was another one where she said that too. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Uh, she meant to die or die with him and for his sake. That one? Uh, yeah, maybe. I also like the end where they were talking about the ocean. Can I see? Oh, yeah, at the end. Can I see? Mm hmm. You should go in order. What? Yeah, whatever. Uh, oh, I didn't go in order. Uh, yeah. Um. Hmm. Yeah. Um. It is only when we are very happy that we can bear to gaze merrily upon the vast, limitless expanse of water, rolling on and on with such persistent, irritating mo monotony, to the accompaniment of our thoughts, whether grave or gay. When they are gay, the waves echo their gaiety. But when they are sad, then every breaker, as it rolls, seems to bring additional sadness and to speak to us of hopelessness and of the pettiness of all our joys. That's the blood. Yeah. I never feel that. <laughs> I can't. I can't see that. I'm always happy when I look at the ocean. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surrounded by it, of well, course. Well, you know, it's but... all the melancholy, sad walks along the ocean and the... In, well, like, but in it's... sensibility, when they have the ocean playing with the sap, Sad music in the background. It's wonderful. Anyways. The sea is very romantic. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's also, it can also What be... are you laughing for? I'm not. Yes, you were. That wasn't my laugh. <laughs> that was supposed to be. Never mind. Um, no, but they can also be, like, kind of sad. I don't know. The, like I said, the perpetual monotony. Anything else we need to lift off the chapter? Um, I'm surprised that Sir Andrew, um... That was such a cool thing. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Sir Andrew so quickly, so quickly, I, I guess, you know, I, we're reading it and we can't hear her saying it, but how she just, he just kind of believed her so easily, it seems. I don't think it was quite easily. It took him a little bit. I think. I but guess. when he believed her, he believed her. I guess. And then he... <laughs> oh, but it was so, so neat. Just how, you know, she's, you know, it's his, it's his leader. You know, he looks up to him and he, you know, follows him, you know, and does anything for him and, um, Sir Percy. And, um, and, you know, now he's taking care of Marguerite and, and they're going on together to hopefully save Sir Percy. And, you know, he's telling her all about, you know, his, his greatest victories and his, you know, how he's, how he's, um, uh, conquered, you know, conquered in, in France and, 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 uh, saved others. Um, and just such a cool picture. Mm -hmm. Such a cool thing. Yes. Which they also put in the book. In the movie. I think it's really funny that Joey thinks there's a little something. Yeah, that, that was pretty that. funny. <laughs> that was really funny. <laughs> why Sally is wondering why she's so serious when she's going to elope with her gallant lover. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on, people. Yeah. How, did they say how old Percy was? Did we hear that? 
Chopin? What did we just read where it said he was more he was nearer forty than thirty? Uh that was Chopin. Okay. I yeah, think she's like twenty five, does it say? Twenty four, twenty five? Twenty something. Twenty early early twenties. He's saying, like thirty, I think. I think Percy's thirty. Or okay. something like that. Or about thirty, right. Well see, I uh, it keeps saying young young the young man out of uh, Sir um what Andrew is. Yes, of Sir Andrew. And so I wonder how old he is. Hmm. Oh, that's very no, no. funny. The advertisement that, says young man. <laughs> young man. <laughs> um, that was very funny that, um, I lost what I was going to say. Ugh. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The Marguerite was like, like, uh, kind of, um, say it over. I think I think it's very funny that Marguerite was kind of um, um she thought that she always thought about Sir Percy uh, the Sir Brunel and like how great he was and how you know romantically he was what the mysterious hero from just always unconsciously loved when that entity was still unknown to her yeah and that's kind of funny and the shadowy king of her heart my goodness that's funny. So she's getting her wish in the end. She's saying, oh, that was a man that I could have loved when she said that. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of, of the end of the movie when she goes, my own sympathy, uh, like, cut my own scarf, be the man. Yeah. No. What is it? They stick in there. They stick in there. We're sprinchy. We're saying, we're saying everywhere. Or, we, they stick in there. They stick in there. Those Frenchies are sticking everywhere. Is he in heaven or is he in heaven? My own elusive Pimpernel. Seems to be really good. It's a poet. <laughs> oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the best part of that movie is when she goes to the jail <laughs> cell with him. Yes. And I meet Can up again. Huh? Nothing. It's the best part. Yeah, it really is. And then this, this very so, uh, uh, delicate strains the violin playing their theme. <laughs> It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not in here. How do you know? We haven't read it yet. I've read the ending before. <sighs> Shame upon me. Um. I don't care if you're fibs for society. Alright, well. That's all, folks. Be sure to comment and... Tell us what you think, and uh, what do you think is going to happen next? And uh, um, who would you cast as Sir Percy? Who are tall actors who you would cast as Sir Percy? And who would you cast as Marguerite? Because that's another thing. Do, yeah. Hmm. Yes, she's be very beautiful because I keep saying how beautiful she is. Yes. I've always had her with dark hair. I guess it's from the movie putting that in my mind, but I don't think I think she said it was I think the book it said it was like gold. Like yes. Blonde? No, gold, brown, something like that. I don't remember that. Hearing that. But anyway, yes. So I don't take up any more of your time. And we shall see you later. Or talk to you later. You don't see you. You don't see us. We'll just talk to you. <laughs> yes, and if you are interested, we will um, take uh, pictures of our cookies this weekend when we yes. make them. We've been blathering about them for the past three weeks. Yes, uh, let us know if you are interested in seeing how the end result is. We may just take pictures of them anyway, despite what you think. But <laughs> yes, all right. So, ta-ta for now. We'll see you next week and stay with us. Yeah, you're almost to the end. Yeah, that was strange. Goodbye. Goodbye.